Welcome, everybody. Excited uh, to show you some of the advanced stuff in FME 2021. Um, and um, we'll go to the next slide. And so it's about advanced job control, which is one of the things that um, as FME server deployments grow, that is really important. I'm Don Murray, and, uh, and I spend a lot of my time thinking about server and cloud and, um, and, and that sort of thing. And I'm here with Ryland. So introduce yourself. Everyone. I'm Rylan Mastak, and I'm one of the product managers for FME Server. I tried to wear blue today because I looked at my profile picture and I realized I didn't have glasses and I didn't have a beard. So you can tell I've been working from home for a little while, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We're going to look at how um, server workloads are changing with FME Server. And then um, we're going to talk about, you know, how, um, you know, we can understand server load better. Um, and the whole goal, of course, is to enable you to manage your server and determine things like when you should use dynamic engines and things like that. And then we're going to look at the, the new job information that is throughout FME server. So for any workspace, uh, you can tell no matter where it's run, um, what the job characteristics are of it. Then we'll talk about some management challenges that people have with server. And, um, and of course, those are what drove um, the, the functionality you're going to see today. And, um, and then we'll look at some advanced job control in action. So we'll do some demos and then some Q&A. So, Rylan, why don't you tell us about how server workloads are changing? Oh, yeah, of course. So that's right. Server workloads are changing. And what do we mean? Well, the pace of technologies and computing power is growing and growing. And it's growing at a rate that we're still able to see trends emerge on smaller and smaller timelines. So there used to be such high demand for scheduled or one-off data integration tasks, but we have seen a shift towards on-demand and real-time integration. So gone are those days of nightly database synchronization updates. Yeah. And we've reacted to the change in demand by introducing new features for FME Server and the FME platform. So we have FME Server apps, which allows you to share your workflows while hiding the complexity of the implementation, allowing end users to run workflows on demand. We have automations, which are workflows that are set up to respond to events, run data integration tasks, and initiate downstream events. And now we have streams in 2021, a refreshed approach to processing near or real-time data. And all these features have been created in response to the demand of our customers. And the commonality among them is that when the predictability of our workspaces or data integration tasks, when the predictability of when they occur is decreasing, then we need to have a way to react to that. Mm -hmm. So partly for the reason is more workflows are time sensitive. Our customers want the results more quickly. The features that we've introduced to FME Server provide different avenues to achieve that. So again, we have FME Server apps that run on demand. They operate on the notion that I click go, I want the results delivered back to me. I don't want to wait around for that result. Automations by their design are responding immediately to internal and external triggers. So we expect the data to flow like a river during melt season for that. And FME Server streams, by the nature of its name, are dealing with streaming data. And we can't let the incoming pile up because some systems are delivering data at impressive rates and we need to process it just as quickly. So compounding the change in demand are the changes to architecture, both options and the requirements. We observe the size of deployments and the number of workspaces or data integration workflows. Even for smaller organizations, they're growing. So again, we have reacted to the need of our customers by introducing new options like dynamic engines on FME server and embracing support for new deployments like Kubernetes. So that leads us to a few important questions. How can I balance the load on my server? If I'm faced with unexpected or unpredictable demand, what do I do? How can I ensure that data integration tasks that are important can continue to be appropriately prioritized against others that are submitted at the same time? And how can I leverage new options like dynamic engines to keep a cap on rising cost? Yeah, great. Thanks, Ryland. Yeah, so in, in FME Server 2021, we've introduced some new um, capabilities to address these um, changing deployments and demands on FME Server. 
So the first thing we've done is we understand that for users to administer and get the maximum value from FME Server, they need to really understand the server load. In the past, this was very difficult. You would have to open a workspace, look at the log file, and um, and that and if you have thousands or tens of thousands of workspaces, that's really really difficult. It's also difficult to see when a workspace is running, what it's um, you know the, how do you know what it should be taking and things like that. So so we're <clears throat> what we're trying to do with this new understanding server load is now you can um, design your FME server. Um, task assignment so machines don't get overloaded with simultaneously large jobs. That's one thing um, that we see a lot and Ryland's going to go into more detail and demonstrate how this can happen. And also for these FME server apps, um, when a user um, goes to a web page and clicks a button to run it, they expect the response immediately. And if they don't get a response immediately, we know exactly what happens is users just go and submit it again and again and again and again. And that just creates this cascading effect on on the server. So you want to be able to structure your server such that those small time sensitive jobs like for FME apps and automations um, are able to get access to resources quickly. And so some of the information that we're collecting is um, CPU time, um, percentage of CPU. Um, you might have a job that is using, now that we have some multi-threaded things, it's using over 100% of CPU um, you'll have other ones that are spending a lot of their time waiting on external resources like web services um, or even a very slow database. And, and you can all have um, CPU percentages are down in the single digits or lower. Um, also, how much memory usage does this workspace want to use? Um, and that's important to ensure that you don't end up with all your large jobs on one machine. And then, of course, elapsed time. Um, how long does it take this workspace to to go. So those are the ones that we've introduced um, in FME Server 2021.0. If there's other information that you want um, as you start working with this, please let us know. This journey um, is, has just begun. And so, yeah, so why did we build this? Um, again, we're seeing larger and larger deployments. And as the deployments get larger and larger, the investment is larger and larger, and people want to make sure that they're maximizing um, their use of um, their FME resources. And, and it was really difficult to really understand the characteristics of a workspace. You'd have to, all the information was buried in the log file, but that's not really where you want it. You want it to be that information to be used to control your server, not to do some, you know, post-processing research and then try to figure it out. And, um, and it was very difficult to control which workspaces were assigned to which engine. Sure, you could assign a repository to an engine, but not all the workspaces in a repository have the same runtime characteristics. So why? So that really wasn't, um, you know, terribly useful. And um, yeah, and it was impossible for organizations to assign jobs to queues based on, you know, runtime, runtime characteristics. And that's um, really um, what we wanted to do. And and this be, this is becoming more and more important as, you know, we're building FME Server to support these elastic platforms like Kubernetes and serverless and, um, and things like that. That's where the world's going and um, we're building all the infrastructure to be able to support those in the most cost-effective um, manner. So um, yeah, so job information in um, FME Server 2021. So Rylan, what's, what's this one about? Yeah, so look, we're gonna take a look at where we can see job information and understand how that's gonna be useful for us. So the, all the job metrics that Don introduced and he mentioned, they're here on the completed jobs page in FME server. And you can see that all of the information, the CPU, the peak memory, it's all available per job. So that we can see exactly how many resources that particular run of a job or our data integration task took. We see this percent CPU, peak memory, elapsed time. And then if you navigate to the workspaces view or repositories, you'll notice that all those headers are saying averages and we can see the total number of runs. So when we're on this view here, we can see across all runs for the workspace on our FME server, how are the job information metrics? You're able to reset these metrics, of course. So if you publish, uh, big version 2.0, completely redid your workflow, then you can reset the metrics and start from fresh. Yeah. Then we also have the same job information on the schedules page. 
but this is only scoped to have the averages where the jobs are running in response to the schedule trigger. So if you have an on-demand run or it's run through a server app, that's not going to be represented in the schedules page, only the jobs that run for the scheduled workspace you have. And, and automations, um, it is possible you could have the same workspace in different spots in the same automation. And, um, and it makes sense that those workspaces may not take the same amount of resources because the parameters that are passed into the workspace can influence, of course, the amount of resources that that workspace would take. So when you go into automations, if you look, you will see so for each automation, it shows you the amount of, um, of time. So for this one um, up, up top there, fast, you can see it took 94%, took about you know, 1.2 seconds of CPU. Um, and the second one took you know, less than one second and, um, and 580. So you can see that the, the time is different. So if we compare those side by side, so you can see, you can see that they're very, very different um, job statistics. One of them, the peak memory is 17 megabytes. The other one is 580 kilobytes um, and things like that. So um, again, these job metrics are really key. As you build bigger and bigger automations, it's, you want to know where is the time taking. So now you can look from workspace to workspace to find out exactly where the time is being taken in your automation. So yeah, and that's, so that's the other um, area where we, we've done that. So yeah, so now we're gonna look at some um, job management challenges. Yeah, now if you can imagine a time before FME Server 2021, uh, well, it just came out two weeks ago, you know that we didn't have the job information or the job metrics that we have now. It was difficult for us to manage how jobs would be distributed across our FME engines. For a lot of us, we install a bunch of engines across many machines, or maybe we just have one powerful machine with a bunch of engines. Maybe we've tinkered with queues and assigning repositories to those FME server queues. But in a lot of cases, we only needed to look deeper into job management when we encountered a problem. So let's take a look at the first challenge here, overloaded machines. This is when a machine is running multiple heavy jobs jobs that require CPU resources, memory resources, and it's gonna bog down when we get multiple running. So in the image here on the bottom right, depicted by the anvil, those are representing our heavy jobs. So here we have two FME engine hosts. Each host is running two engines. So that means we can process two data integration tasks per machine. If I end up in the scenario where I have two heavy jobs processing on the same machine, they're going to be competing for resources. That's the one on the right. The one on the left, we have a light job and we have a fast job. That machine's likely going to have no problem. So let's take a look how we can observe the slowdown. So on the completed jobs machine here, you'll observe that we're actually running the same heavy workspace in all instances. But look at the difference in runtime. We're going from 28 minutes to just over four hours. And we have some information available in FME Server 2021 that lets us get some insight. If we look at the peak memory usage, we can see that the jobs that have a lot of memory usage are actually processing more quickly. They have more resources available to process. This heavy workspace has a massive shortest pass path network finder. So the job, the second one there, that doesn't have as much memory resources available, just about half of the other jobs is taking way over twice the time. And similarly here, with a percent CPU, we can see that that second job must be competing for resources. It's not able to multi-thread, it's not able to do much at all. And on this next image here, if you've ever seen this before, this is the hallmark of an overloaded machine. This is a snippet from the job log. You can see if you've ever had this optimizing memory usage, please wait. You can see it's happening every second, every few seconds. That is a sign where our job is competing for resources on the machine, whether it be another FME workspace that's processing, or perhaps if you have any other applications running. Yeah. yeah. 
Awesome. That, thanks, Ryland. That's awesome. And that's we, and we see that a lot. We'll have users um, who will say, geez, I have this job that normally takes 40 minutes and it was taking four hours. So if you see that, then um, that's an example of an overloaded machine where a big jobs land on. I was on a call last night with a client and they brought up exactly this problem. So I said, oh, we're going to talk about it tomorrow with the webinar. 2021, we've built some things to help you address that. So the second challenge is um, where jobs get starved or blocked. And so in this case, I had heavy, but it could also be the light job. Because if we go back and look at the light jobs, the light jobs on the bottom there takes one minute and 26 seconds to run. So if there's four of those there, then these fast jobs are, are going to get blocked. And, um, and if those fast jobs are associated with an FME server app or something that we really need, it needs to be fast, then all of a sudden, um, everything's going to back up. So that's the second challenge. We want to make sure that these really key um, jobs get access to um, the resources and they're not blocked. Um, and again, that can really result in really be um, poor experience for users. And as organizations build more and more automation flows and more and more um, FME server app flows, then that can really be um, a big problem. And the third challenge is, you know, we introduced this whole notion of CPU time based um, FME processing capabilities called dynamic engines. And of course, now you have this dynamic engines available. And so now the question is what types of jobs or when should I use dynamic engines to maximize, um, you know, my, my value? And so first of all, we'll just give you a little summary on what dynamic engines are. So the first question is, people always ask, are dynamic engines exactly the same as standard engines? And the answer is yes. From a functionality standpoint, there is no different. Whatever you do with the standard engine, you can do with a dynamic engine. The only difference is with a standard engine, you, you, buy, a, you, you buy it um, perpetually or as part of a subscription. And it's one price, doesn't matter whether that engine is busy or whether that engine is um, idle. You're, You've bought that engine, you can use it however you wish. With dynamic engines, forget about engine, the number of engines, and you'll see when we do a demo later, you can launch as many dynamic engines as you want because you only pay for the CPU time. And um, I challenge you to come to the World's Fair because we build a massive FME server deployment and we use dynamic engines, of course, because we're only interested in the CPU time. And the other thing to remember is it's CPU time, it's not elapsed time. And so this enables you to really scale engines up, scale them down, and really pick the types of jobs that you want to do your dynamic engines with. So this is the dynamic engine pricing. And um, when you are evaluating FME server now, you get um, 100 um, hours of processing time so you can start to understand how it works and get a feel for it um, so you can get comfortable but these are really people are really embracing this because it just gives them so much flexibility and um, and so now let's look at our jobs and see you know which ones are seem to be good candidates for um, dynamic engines well this light one um, it's using it's the least CPU intensive it uses like less than 1% of the CPU. So that's that's a good candidate. Um, the heavy shape one probably isn't. It's using 134%. And that's something that's really interesting. With FME, the engine, we're multi-threading it now. So we're at each release of FME, you're going to see more and more and more of it using multi-threading. And, um, and that makes the CPU more than 100%, because effectively these CPUs now, they're within one chip, but they have multiple CPUs, multiple hyper threads um, and things like that. And in fact, in FME 2021.1, one of the metrics you're gonna get from the engines when the engines register is it is gonna tell you the number of CPUs that it has. So that'll be yet another way for you to assign engines to queues and then because we know with this heavy one, in fact, if you had eight cores, it would probably get up to seven over 700% of CPU. So that might not be a good one for dynamic engines. But, um, but this one, again, fast, 80% um, of CPU, but it's really, really um, fast. So that might be, that's the most time sensitive one. So you might want to put that one on um, dynamic engines. 
Yeah, so I think now we're going to have um, some some Q and A. Are there any questions out there, Holly? Hello. Yes, lots of questions. Excellent. So um, let me just pull a few. So the first one uh, is: Can you run a report that shows the job statistics? Can you run a report? Um, you you could you'd have to use the rest um the, the short answer is yes you could you could use the rest api to pull information but the the short answer is no at this point we don't have a way that's a great request um it would be nice if at the bottom of the job table or the workspaces you could just have a button that would basically um print those out um in some sort of order so that's um we'll make a note of that one because yeah. one of the things that an fme server that we're not happy with well, i like to share what we're not happy with <laughs> well is our dashboards and also the home screen. And, um, and in full tra transparency, we really worked hard to get this functionality into FME server. And now we're just at the beginning of ways of harvesting it and making it available to users. So I think a report would be awesome mm -hmm. if you could just generate a report that could show you all the, you know, the, the workspaces maybe sorted by the most user um, to, to the least. So. Yeah, so let yeah. us know what exactly you would like in that report. That's a great question. And I've just added to um, the chat as well, even though dashboards maybe isn't your favorite thing on FME server, Don, because we do have the REST API, um, we have a knowledge article on how to use the API to start to generate some of those dashboards with yeah. some example workspaces as well. Um, right. So there is an article where you can pull out some workspaces already and, and publish those in start to create some of these dashboards with that API. Yeah, Thanks, that's awesome. Yeah, because one, one thing we I should have mentioned earlier is that Don mentioned it, touched on it. All this information is still available through the REST API. So while we present it in the web interface on those uh, completed jobs page, schedules page, and automations, all those places, you still could perform some REST API calls and pull this uh, more programmatically. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a great okay. question. Another question we have is, are the job statistics written to the database um, and how persistent is this statistic information? Uh, great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they are written to the database and the job statistics are going to be with your FME server installation uh, throughout its lifetime. If you republish a workspace, you're going to want to reset the job statistics. You can do that per workspace, but the statistics themselves are separate from the job history and the job logs that we capture, so it is able to be more persistent. Uh, one important thing to note is that we currently don't migrate the job information. So as long as your FME server is, um, you, you maintain the same build and everything, then you'll have those job statistics. Okay, perfect. So shall I, is that time for another question? Yeah, let's let's look through the dynamic engine one. That's a fantastic that, question. Yes, that's the one I was going to pull up. So there's, <laughs> there's actually two on dynamic engines, but I think you can probably address them at the same time. So yeah. the first one is, are dynamic engines only for FME server in the cloud, or are they also available in the on-premise FME server? And the second one is, can you purchase both standard and dynamic engines for a server installation? Yes, awesome. Do you want to answer that one, Holly? I mean, we're all dying to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> I can definitely answer that one. So the answer is yes and yes. Dynamic engines are available in the on-premise FME server, as well as FME, your FME server hosted in the cloud. Um, however, they're not available on FME cloud because that already has um, kind of an engineless uh, deployment where you can scale your engines based on the size of your instance. Yeah. Um, and the second question, you can definitely purchase uh, standard and dynamic engines. In fact, I believe you need to have at least one standard engine um, and then to be able to build up with dynamic engines as well. So yes. Right, right. And so, yeah, so so that's fantastic. Yeah, so, so as Holly and Ryland said, yeah, dynamic engines are independent of any deployment um, and you can put them anywhere other than FME Cloud. Um, at this point. But as Holly said, in FME Cloud, you can start as many engines as you want. And um, lots of great questions coming in, so we'll get to some more um, um, at the end. So uh, yeah, so let's uh, continue on. Okay, so here we go. So thanks so much for the great questions. 
So yeah, so now we're going to talk about, you know, those are the challenges that we have, the information that's available. So now we're going to talk about how we use it to um, actually solve these problems with FME Server 2021. So Ryland, let's, how are we going to do that first challenge? Right, the challenge of the overloaded machines. So if you recall, that was the challenge where we had multiple heavy jobs that were going to be processed on FME engines that all resided on the same machine. Those jobs are going to be competing for resources. We need a way to sort that out. Maybe if we could only have uh, we spin up or we provision a machine that has you know 64 cores, 64 gigs memory, just something unbelievable, and that we're able to process one or more of these jobs. So what we can do in FME Server 2021, we can create a queue for jobs that use a lot of CPU. So you'll see here in the engine management, which I'll jump out to in a demo shortly, you can create a queue. You just call it high CPU. All the high CPU jobs are sent here, but it doesn't stop there. The next thing that we do is we will assign jobs to a queue. So we have on the top ribbon there an engine management queues, and then there's job routing rules. This is part of the new job controls configuration available in FME Server 2021. And for this particular job routing rule, we are using different metrics. So that job information that we've been talking about this entire time, this is where we can start to really utilize it and be smart about how we distribute jobs across our FME engines. So in this example here, I'm setting up for my high CPU jobs, I'm defining those as jobs that use greater than 125% CPU. So that's kind of implying some multi-threading. Or if the CPU time is uh, greater than a certain amount of time here. Okay. So both when both of those are true, then it's sent there. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And now that we have our jobs sent to these queues, we need to actually make sure that there's engines available on those queues to process. So under engine assignment rules here, we're able to assign engines to queues based on the name of the engine. So in this case here, we have FME server engine two, engine one. So that's our host machine is called FME server engine two and the engine number is engine one. So we're assigning that one as a dedicated engine for the high CPU queue. There are also properties of engines that we can use and uh, We'll get a sneak peek of that in the demo. So everyone can see my FME server home screen now. This is running FME server 2021. You'll notice we've got this cool blue here on the left here. That's how you know you're in the latest and greatest. One thing I want to point out right away for any of our FME server gurus, the engine management is a rename from the licensing and engines option. So we've moved licensing here under system configuration, and now the engine management is just everything you want to do about engines and queues. So for those, for that queue, to create a queue, we just go to this page here and you can type anything you want here. Let's call this, I already have some from the uh, demo preparation we we're doing. So we'll call this the higher CPU queue. And this is just going to be running really intense jobs. We also have the ability to set priorities here on queues, but I'm going to just leave this as the default here because I'll show you in the job and engine assignment rules how we can do that as well. So after I've created my queue, I can go to the job routing rules. Now, if I want to assign the jobs first or the engines first, it doesn't really matter. We can do either. So when I create a new job routing rule, you can see that I have the ability to specify it as type metric. So that's new for FME Server 2021, leveraging all that new job information. But for people who are familiar with queue assignments, you can actually still do the old way of assigning specific repositories to specific queues. But let's take advantage of some of this new stuff. So we have a rule-based uh, kind of creator here where you can do and or statements and you have access to the four job options, sorry, the new, four new job information options, percent CPU, CPU time. So maybe in this case here, I might say, well, if the CPU percent 
is greater than 100, let's call that. Um, this is going to be the higher CPU jobs. And then I can select that higher CPU queue that I just created. One cool thing is that we can actually create all these different job routing rules and we can enable or disable them. Maybe after some testing, we find that some are useful or we want to try a new iteration of one. We have the ability to turn them on and off. Is there we also have the ability to the priority. Is the order important? Oh, definitely. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Don. Because you can see right now, I have this percent CPU greater than 100% and it's going to be prioritizing top down. So when I turn on this, I'm expecting that, well, if it's higher than 125%, it should go to this queue. But the order I have it in right now, of course, it's, everything is going to go to this higher CPU jobs queue. So what we should do is reorder this, move it up so that first this one is evaluated, then this one, then that one, and so on and so forth. So now that we have our queue, we have some job routing rules, let's make sure that we have engines available for that queue. So I can come to the engine assignment rules page and I can create a new engine assignment rule. We have two options for the type. The name is again going to be familiar for FME server users of the past. You can assign specific engines to queues. So in this scenario, I can say, all right, I'm just going to assign one engine to that queue. That way, when I have a heavy CPU job, I have a dedicated engine for it. It's not going to, I can, I can configure it so that we don't compete for resources and that I only process one of these heavy jobs at a time. So I can assign that to the higher CPU queue. And then I also want to note that we do have the second option here called properties. And this is something that's, again, brand new for FME Server 2021. And this is something that we're currently working on as well uh, for another iteration in a later release. So there are the concept of properties. And in this instance here, we have the property type of dynamic so that if an engine started up and it was a dynamic engine, it would automatically be assigned to the higher CPU queue. And we have some great presentations in the FME World Fair where we're gonna dive into that kind of stuff too. That, that kind of just demonstrates how we can set up a queue, job routing rule, engine assignment rule, and then we'll have our engines uh, respond appropriately to those high CPU jobs. The second challenge is um, jobs get blocked. And so, um, so this is the same pattern. Of course, you're going to see it's the same pattern over and over again. You create a queue, you assign engines to the queue, and you assign jobs to the queue um, using the, um, the job information. So in this case, um, what we do is we um, we create a queue called light jobs, jobs that have low CPU intensity. Um, and then we, um, you know, if Rylan mentioned we could do it in any order. This I did it in the other order, and it doesn't matter. Um, and in this case, we assign engines to queue. So again, I picked uh, FME server engine one um, underscore engine one called light jobs. And um, and um, away we away we go. And then last but not least, I said I wanted CPU jobs that are less than 5% to be assigned to the queue um, light job. So let's go have a have a look at that. Okay, so here's our uh, our server here, and um, I'll go into engine management again, and um, I'll show you the uh, the rules. So there's all our engines, and you can see the properties Ryland talked about right here. So right now we only have there's none that are, have the value dynamic at this point. And, uh, but you can see standard, you can also see the platform. Maybe you have a server where you might have some Windows and some Linux, and so you could, you could use that as well. Um, and then here are the queues that we have. And what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'll walk through some of these rules and then um, I'll, I'll turn them on. So we have light jobs, jobs that have a low intensity. We have um, high CPU um, jobs are sent here. And, um, and then we have some engine assignment rules that we built. So we have um, a dynamic one, we have high CPU, and we have light jobs. They're all disabled. So what I'll do now is I'll show you what can easily happen when we um, run this. So I'll enable the heavy one. And we'll just look at it. We'll see every second we're going to um, submit a, um, a heavy job. 
and um, I say okay and then no surprise you know there's some jobs that are queued um, they're already submitted to the queue so now you can see now my server is completely bogged down so it doesn't matter now if I go to um, submit these fast jobs so I can just go like this um, you know and in here and um, enable it it's going again going to go once every second um, um, and now you'll see that my jobs, there's no way that those those jobs are queued, but they're starved. They're going to, um, you know, these ones are running. The ones that are queued, I should turn off my heavy schedule. i got a lot of jobs being scheduled here, so I'll turn off this one here. Action, disable. And now we're going to go to the, um, the jobs, the queued ones. And so now we should see all these, these ones going um, on. So jobs running is heavy and then the queued ones so these are all the lights and the fast yeah i got a lot of jobs being submitted because i'm getting excited about how great this is but you can see none of them are going to get any cpu because we know these heavy jobs are in fact never going to um you know they're going to take a long time to process both machines are overloaded um on the queued ones now i'm going to delete all those because we don't want to uh okay yeah and then we're going to cancel them all and so there we go and hopefully the schedules are all turned off nope they're not so that would be the first thing to do actions disable jobs queued yeah cancel okay there we go and then running will kill these two because clearly we don't want to be waiting for four hours so those are all canceled too and so yeah so there we go so that's um you know, you can see how very quickly, if you're not controlling your heavy jobs, how things can get um, bogged up. So the next, the next one is, is, you know, we want to create use effectively dynamic engines. And so, um, and the idea is, um, you know, we want to start this, if doing this is the same way with the exception of we're going to create dynamic engines, then we're going to do the queue, then the engines and assign jobs to the job information. So what we're going to do here is um, in a standard installation, it's really easy to create dynamic engines. We're simply going to um, create dynamic engines. And the thing about dynamic engines is, is if you understand the memory footprint and the resources, you can actually create more dynamic engines than you would um, standard engines that were, were responsible for supporting small and large jobs. So if I create dynamic engines, I'm only gonna give small, memory jobs i can actually create more dynamic engines than i would if i'm creating standard engines that are going to be servicing you know all sorts of jobs and the nice thing is is i'm only paying for the cpu so so we would do that and we're going to go for the dynamic fast job so again we're going to create a queue then we're going to um, create, create an engine property so the engine properties are from the engines page you can see all the engine properties that an engine reported to the server when it was um, connecting and as a user setting this up you can create your own properties as well so um, when the engine um, is being created you can actually tell it what other properties to add and here are the ones that uh, came with dynamic and dynamic or standard the name of the engine the name of the server is FME server engine one the build number and the um, and the platform and so I'm going to use that I'm going to create an engine rule um, based on a property. And, um, and so I got to click add property. And this is the weakest part of the experience in FME 2021.0. And this is where everybody um, gets confused. And, and the problem is, is that it says create an engine property. And you're like, well, what does that even mean? And so what it means is you got to go back here and, and pick those are the engine properties you have available. And then you have to, um, you have to type it in. So that's where... Um, I know it helped folks internally, and, and we've all recognized that this is probably the most confusing part. And um, in 2021.1, um, those properties are automatically populated, so you don't have to add them and type them. Because I even had a bug where I misspelled the property I typed in, and then I was pulling my hair out. And as you can tell, I was successful. I pulled all my hair out. And, um, and, um, and so now I can just use a property of dynamic. And then it's... Um, it's basically going to be um, the same as every as everything else. I'm going to target the fast 
and um, I just look at it and it has an average of CPU. So I'm going to say if C percent CPU is greater than 70 and the elapsed time is less than five seconds, then I'm going to assign that to dynamic fast jobs. So now we're going to do the demo. We have our FME management. We have four engines and um, we don't have any job rules. Um, engine rules and we only have the default queue and um, and so it's a standard standard deployment You'll see the properties here that we're we talked we're going to talk about and we're going to use um, a little bit later So the first thing I'll do is I'm just going to um, show you what happens normally if we submit um, Some jobs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run some workspace a few times this heavy guy I'll submit it uh, four times and then you'll see um that the server gets um, overloaded. And since this guy takes um, a long time, you'll see that um, all the jobs now that are running are the heavies. And if I run a different job, say a, a light guy or a fast guy, he's simply gonna be starved up. So, um, so now I look at jobs, um, queued, and you see that this fast guy, and he's gonna be sitting there probably for four hours, because these machines, as we know, are overloaded and so that's not what we want and so what we're going to do now is we will kill these guys and we'll build a rule that shows um, the um, how we deal with the heavy guy first and um, so that's really simple so engine management first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a queue and we'll call it heavy we'll call it heavy and we'll create a queue okay the next thing we're going to do is do job routing rules. We're going to create a new job routing rule. We'll call it heavy jobs. And we're going to say if CPU is greater than 125 um, and um, elapsed time is greater than um, 10 minutes is what we're going to do. Okay, like that. And we're going to select the queue. We're going to put it on the heavy queue. And we're going to say OK. And then engine assignment rules. We're going to create one. We'll call it heavy jobs. Whoa. And we're going to go by name. And we're going to pick an engine. Engine 2, 1. This is a four core um, machine. And we're going to assign it to the heavy job like that. So now if we go and run the job, the heavy jobs, we'll submit um, four more again. We'll go like this and we'll run it, okay? And um, if we look now and see what's happening on our running, you'll see we have one job on the heavy queue. So let's add a few more. Run. 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 And now if we look at jobs, we're going to see one is running and um, the other three are queued. Okay, and so um, there you go. So now the next thing we want to show is, um, you know, the dynamic, um, the, the dynamic engines, um, because we want to be able to uh, to show how to allocate dynamic engines. Of course, when in the previous one, when all those four heavy jobs were on the engines, nothing else would be um, if that was submitted, it would have just blocked. So, but now how do we use dynamic engines for those light guys? So the first thing we're going to do is go to engines here. And um, we're going to, we hear our two hosts, and we're going to start some dynamic engines. And because I know I'm targeting um, small um, dynamic engines, um, we know that I can have lots of, I can, small jobs, I can create more dynamic engines because um, I'm going to restrict the, uh, you know, the amount of uh, memory that, uh, that, that they have. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to save, change on that. And then, um, so we're going to put six dynamic engines there. And um, I'd ask me, are you sure? I say, okay. And now if I refresh this page, I could wait in a few seconds, but immediately now you're going to see I have one, two, three, four, five, six dynamic engines. And you can tell by it has the property dynamic. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. So now I go into queue. I'm going to create a fast queue, I'm going to call it fast queue. And um, priority five, whatever, doesn't really matter. And, um, and so now I'm going to create a job routing rule. And on this job routing rule, I want, um, this is going to be fast jobs. I want CPU is greater than 70%. Um, 
and elapsed time is less than five seconds, okay? And I'm going to assign that to the fast queue like that. Okay, so hopefully I got that right. Okay, and now I'm going to do an engine assignment rule. I'm going to call this fast um, dynamic, just for lack of, and I'm going to say a property. And I'm going to say if the property is dynamic, now I want to add that to the fast queue like that. So I'm going to say okay. And so that should be um, what I need to do. Um, let me just look at, yeah, I think it's good. Okay, and where did I get those values from? I got them if I go back here and I look at um, my fast jobs, you can see um, that the lapse time is less than five seconds and the CPU is greater than 70. So that's exactly what I did there. And, um, and um, so that's what I did. And so now I'm going back here. And now when I submit some jobs, I'm gonna do this one via a schedule. So fast, short, fast jobs. I'm gonna um, go in there, I'm gonna edit it and I'm gonna enable it. I'm gonna say every second it's gonna submit a new job. Start immediately, fast, okay. And so now if I go to my jobs um, running, the heavy guys there, oh, I actually caught a fast, but you're gonna see that they're coming in so, f the, the fast jobs are, are, they're coming in really fast, but I got all these dynamic engines. And so um, when I look at the completed, I can see all the dynamic um, jobs are being um, um, handled. And so everything's good. If I go back to my engine management and I look at my deployment, you'll see that I have, you know, all these dynamic engines that are also um, there as well. And, um, and so there you have it. That's how we use the engine assignment rules to um, allocate um, jobs to queues to really control um, and maximize um, my server utilization. Also, if I go to system configuration and licensing, I can see how many um, dynamic engines um, time is being um, used. And, you know, as the engines are time, so you just saw that change from 42 to 27. And so, and so, yeah, so there you have it. There's the demos on, um, on this um, controlling your um, jobs with advanced job control. Yeah, anything to add to that, Rylan? Uh, yeah, I guess I have a couple things to say. <clears throat> one, one is that, do you want to go to the jobs completed page for a moment? Sure. I just want to make sure that everyone knows when you have a brand new installation of FME Server 2021, you're going to see all of the new job information. But if you migrate from an older instance, you might need to turn on some of this. So that's right. In the top right, we have the customized columns button where you can see all the different information we're able to have displayed on these different pages. So we can add different things like the ID, repository, who ran it. Uh, we also have two cool ones called source name, source type, where you yeah. can see if it ran from a schedule, an automation, a server app. Uh, so just making aware for everyone out there that we have all these different types of columns you have. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's an easy one to forget. So yeah. So yeah, so there you have it. So that's um, what we have now for, for job control. Um, give it a try. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, what you would like, what else you would like to see. This is the beginning of this whole journey of enabling organizations, you know, you to maximize server by controlling how workspaces are allocated to engines based on their characteristics rather than having to do it by name or by repository. So um, so that's what that's all about. Yeah, so really, yeah, about optimizing job allocation. You know, dynamic engines are new capability. And again, how can you use them to get the most value? Um, you're paying for CPU time. What jobs should you target um, for dynamic engines to get the best value there? And, um, and then last but not least, of course, is you, you know, you want to make sure that the task get your fair share of resources. There's nothing worse than when a machine gets overloaded because actually it's processing less than it would be, um, you know, if, if, if it wasn't. So if you take that one case where that machine, when two landed on that one machine, each job took four hours. Um, whereas 
um, otherwise you would be processing you know one job every 28 minutes so you can see that uh, you know your performance is you know reduced by a factor of uh, more than more than two times so oh I just, I'm just excited for this look at that roller coaster can I sit on the front seat there yeah Zipster looks scared out of his mind doesn't he and and we're going to talk a lot about um, you know FME server. Um, there's two talks there during the world um, world fair that you're going to want to see. The first one is a, a, a trip through the land of FME deployment, where we talk about all the different platforms, all the different ways that you can deploy um, FME from on-premise to cloud to Kubernetes to you know and, and beyond. And then a real fun one was um, you know one that uh, Grant and I did with Laura, Grant, Laura and I called Zipster's Magic Show, where we built the biggest FME server deployment we've ever heard of. I couldn't, and then, I couldn't believe how then, big it was. <laughs> I couldn't believe how big it was. Yeah, I know, I know. And we learned a lot and um, it was a lot of fun. And um, yeah, and there's just so many great user stories as well. So that's always the highlight, so yeah, so. Yay, there's the team. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. And then if we didn't get to your question or if you find you go away after and you're like, oh, I wish I asked that, you can find us on live chat on safe.com or post your question in the community at safe.com slash community. Perfect. Or come to the World Fair and ask all the questions. Yeah, the World Fair is <laughs> It's going to be yeah. a lot of fun. There's prizes. There's lots of fun. It's going to uh, be great. Yeah. Great. So. Okay. All and right. It's no cost. It's a no cost event as well. So yeah, it's gonna be really fun. It's gonna be fun. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, team. Thank I'll you. I'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> Bye. Okay, Holly. Any questions? Oh yes, I'm ready. So okay. uh, first question is probably for Rylan. Um, in your uh, demo, you uh, set up some engine assignment rules for CPU greater than 100%. Yeah. Would you just be able to expand on what makes up CPU and, and how that can be over 100%? Okay, yeah, excellent question. So in the majority of our FME workspaces that run, the CPU percent is probably going to be under 100%. That's just the ratio of the CPU time over the total elapsed time. So the CPU time is filtering out things like uh, network access time. If you have any uh, third party services that you're reaching out to, that's not counted as CPU time. It's only about that raw processing. We get into scenarios where you have greater than 100% CPU when we have uh, transformers or formats in our new workspace that can leverage multi-threading if you have multiple cores on the machine where an FME engine is running. So in our example heavy workspace, we had the shortest pathfinder that's able to leverage some of the uh, multi-threading multiple cores. And so we're tallying those up together and that's why you have a higher CPU percentage, one that's greater than 100. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so next question we had um, is, in future, will you be able to add custom properties onto an engine? Yes, oh, great. you can do that now. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yes, so, yeah. So I, I said you could do that now, but it's not the easiest. So I wasn't <laughs> sure if there was more, more coming in future on that. Yep, there could, there could be. I have, yep, I'm not sure we've talked mm -hmm. about it, but absolutely. Um, I think now you have to, the way you do it now is not very nice, is it, Holly? You have to edit config files. Yes, it's it's not being documented at this point. Okay. Um, I, do, I don't believe, uh, okay. but the process right now would be to go into um, some of the engine configuration files and make changes. Uh, so yeah. this is my yeah. ask then. Can that be in the <laughs> web UI? I like it. Would be nice <laughs> Nice. The great thing about software is that it's ever changing. And when we get yeah. feedback from our customers, of course, we've developed the uh, features we've presented here uh, with customer use cases, but we only have a finite amount of scenarios to work with. So especially on this engine properties, we'd be really interested to hear what type of properties you think of creating and how that would help with your uh, job distribution across FME server. So please do get in touch once you start to play around with this new feature. Okay, great. I've just had another question come in. Um, will there be uh, rules av available for launching dynamic engines coming soon? 
Oh, that's a great question. And the answer is, um, yeah, we can do that. Right now, what you, you can do is you could have dynamic engines that are just sitting there, but not assigned to queues. And then you could, you could have them, you know, during certain times be assigned to queues. And, and um, there would be no, there'd be no cost, FME cost, but of course you would still have infrastructure, your cost, because an engine that's just idle is just effectively swapped out, but uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. There will be hooks for sure to, um, for when we're running on some of these uh, auto scaling elastic platforms. So when certain criteria happen, certain loads on server, at that point, a trigger would be um, um, triggered, I guess would be the word, a trigger would be pulled to, uh, to take some action, um, adding resources to the the, um, the platform. So adding yeah. engines as needed and things like that. But that's a good question. Yeah. Okay, I think we're almost at time. But one more question is when will 2021.1 be released? <laughs> that is in July. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we run the dot releases on a four month cadence. So we just had the dot O release in March. Um, but you are able to download the 21.1 betas from our uh, website if you'd like. Currently, it's it's fairly a mirror image of the 21.0 with an exception for a few things. Um, but you'll see in the next coming weeks and months that we'll start to understand like how different 21.1 is from 21.0. But even though we have some things coming in 21.1, we have a big splash still with 21.0. So I encourage you, you don't need to wait. You don't need to wait for the dot one releases anymore. Uh, things are a lot more stable and uh, than they used to be. Yeah, yeah. And there's other goodies coming, of course, being able to see the load on server in general through graphical, through the web UI, um, which is useful when you're scheduling tasks to identify when the server seems to be less loaded. So other things, um, are all around server loader coming as well. So, but yeah, lots coming. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll probably leave it there. I think we're right on time now, Stephanie. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So, so thanks everybody. And thanks for uh, living through my um, excitement as I'm doing a demo <laughs> at light speed. Um, I appreciate everybody's patience on that. And um, yeah, and thanks Holly and thanks Ryland for, for um, supporting this and um, your great work.